This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagarderes, streaming live from the International Bariatric Club Studios at the International Institute of Metabolic Medicine in Baja, Mexico. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Bariatric Surgery exclusive event is Nutritional Complications After SADI S and BPD DS identification, treatment, and prevention. I will feature experts from Italy, the United States, the Netherlands, Brazil, and Mexico. The IBC University of Oxford webinar partnership would like to thank Zoom Video Communications based in California, Laparoscopic Surge based in Tunisia, and Bariatric News based in the United Kingdom, and Bariatric Channel based in Brazil for setting up and promoting this regularly scheduled online academic series. We would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Stryker, Ethicon Endosurgery, our gold sponsors, USGI Medical, David Medical, Medtronic, Lexington Medical, Reach Surgical, Blue Sail Surgical. Our silver sponsors, Apollo Endosurgery, GD Metabolic Solutions. Our bronze sponsors, Arthrex, ConMed. This is the 86th webinar of the IBC Oxford Academic Series that is streaming live globally to viewers through the IBC website, ibcclub.com. Org, the IBC YouTube channel via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Instagram, and Twitter. This IBC Oxford University webinars are organized by Professor Harris Quaja, consultant bariatric surgeon and director of IBC Oxford Education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital Imperial College London and Christchurch, Oxford University. And Mr. Bruno Gromo, consultant bariatric surgeon and co-director of the IBC Oxford Education based at John Radcliffe Hospital, University of Oxford, UK. This event will be chaired by Professor Marco Raffaelli from Italy and Professor Scott Shekora from the United States and will be moderated by Professor Caetano Marquesini from Brazil and Dr. Edo Arts from the Netherlands. Professor Marco Raffaelli is head of the Division of Endocrine and Metabolic Surgery, Fondazione Policlinico Universitario Agostino Gemelli, IRCCS, in Rome, full professor of surgery, Università Cattolica de Sacro Cuoro, in Rome, and board member, Italian Society of Surgery for Obesity and Metabolic Diseases, CICOB, and director, CICOB, postgraduate school of bariatric surgery. Professor Scott Shikora is Professor of Surgery, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard University, President of IFSO, and past president of ASMBS, and Editor-in-Chief of Obesity Surgery. I will now pass it on to Professor Raffaelli to introduce our moderators. Good afternoon to everybody. I uh, would like first to thank uh, Dr. Aris Squadja for organizing this uh, wonderful meeting on uh, complication NBC for organizing this meeting on the complication of uh, CEDIS and BPD. And it's really an honor and, uh, and a privilege to introduce our moderators, um, Professor uh, Caetano Marchesini from Brazil, former president of the Brazilian Society of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery and members of IFSA, and Dr. De Edo Arts from the Netherlands, who is consultant bariatric surgeon, CEO, and medical director of our Lurian and White Works clinics in the Netherlands. He's also associate editor of obesity surgery and member of the communication committee of IFSO and IFSO European chapter. He, um, he will be also the first uh, speaker of this webinar and he will focus on the clinical manifestation of nutritional disaster following SADIS and Billy Pankrat diversion with Juliana Switch. Please, Sedo. Professor Raffaelli, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, be here again. And uh, let's start the presentation. So give me a heads up. I think everybody can see my screen right now. There we go. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about nutritional disasters following CDS and BPDDS and its clinical manifestations as part of this session of IBC International Bariatric Club. I always think it's a good thing to actually know who is talking to you. So although some of you might know me, most of, of you probably won't. Um, I have my own clinic in the Netherlands, or a couple of them, uh, in which we do surgery and other treatments for obesity, like balloons and um, uh, Saxenda, for example. It's around 50-50%. So last year, I did uh, around 800 bariatric procedures, and the rest are balloons and Saxenda. Now, if you go to look at BPDDS and CDS surgery, actually, on the one hand, they do not differ that much going from uh, looking uh, from the mouth downward. And on the other hand, they are quite um, different. You can 
do them as primary procedures. And far as I still know, the BPDDS has been not so popular over recent years. Um, and the CDS has been coming and coming, um, but mainly not as primary procedure in my clinics, because if I look at my patients, then on average, we perform these procedures as being part of a second procedure, especially in patients that have lost good weight with a gastric sleeve, then regain weight, and unfortunately are unable to hold on to the weight and regain it. So we could in the past choose, especially for the BPDDS, um, and nowadays in the last, let's say five years, we more often choose for the CDS sometimes. It has its pros and cons, but I'm going to talk about nutrition here. And keep in mind that a patient that uh, has a primary BPDDS or CDS is a different patient than the one that already had a sleeve in the past. Research shows that these patients have different eating habits compared to each other. Especially those sleeve patients, if you look at them closely, within one year, even though they might be using multivitamins, 75% of them already has one of or more um, deficiencies coming from that sleeve that was not there pre-surgery. And thus screening patients that undergo secondary surgery with BPDDS or CDS are very important. Screen those patients and screen them again and again where necessary. Now, this is a nice review actually showing differences in between the two types of surgery. Um, again, um, this is a meta-analysis and it only holds around 2,000 patients, around 800 CDS and around 1,000 uh, BPDDSs. And as you can see here, something I would not have expected actually, is that the CDS and BPDDS in the midterm, let's say 36 months here, seem to have similar results in terms of total weight loss. And total weight loss is great. I mean, on average, if you have a total weight loss of around 30, 35%, then people are back to their original weight, especially in these groups, because the average BMI these patients had before the start of their surgery was around 40. Now, talking about disasters after BPDDS, there are many, but the, the thing is that many people do not really report on them. Um, in my clinic as well, I've seen my fair share of disasters in nutrition, let's say, in these patients. I've had two patients with night blindness, of which one would not, let's say, recover after we gave them high doses of vitamin A. So the one that remained actually had still night blindness and has uh, trouble getting out of bed in the night going to the toilet, for example. And also hypocalcemia is quite common, actually, if people do not take their multivitamin or especially, of course, the calcium supplements in BPDDS, we uh, give an average advice of three to four tablets of 500 uh, milligrams of carbonate a day. And still a few of those um, actually have hypocalcemia after a couple of years. And that has to do, of course, with the changed anatomy. So the bowel habits are an important part of it. And of course, you want to sometimes help people with a BPDDS, for example, with reducing their uh, bowel habits in terms of the frequency and the consistency. But um, also think about if you do not treat that, it on average leads to more deficiencies in fat soluble vitamins. But the biggest problem in the past that we had with BPDDS is, of course, protein deficiency. It was the reason actually to elongate the common channel again after um, we did surgery in around 10 to 15 percent of our patients because they had protein deficiencies after a couple of years. So weighing the, the scale, let's say the pros and cons is always quite difficult. And I must say that these extremes in surgery are often, in our case, uh, used only in patients with relatively high BMIs. Now, if you look at the CDS and the BPDDS, on average, um, people tend to calculate the common channel in the CDS. And I would say, let's calculate or use the, the average common channel in the BPDDS as well, if you look at deficiencies. 
But in many cases, the total, uh, let's say, elementary limb and common channel is used and mentioned in the BBDS to um, not go to, let's say, the three uh, meters in a CDS now advised. It was 250. But on average, the common channel in a BPDS is only 50 to 100 centimeters. I would tend always to go over um, the 100 centimeters, but that is what is reported in literature. And if you look at the differences, um, I do not know whether the pointer works, but if you look at the differences in the CDS relatively high, some of the digestive uh, uh, um, uh, enzymes and bile are actually put on uh, uh, to the food just after the pylorus. And that only happens in the BPDDS after, let's say, the first two meters. Um, that difference makes a pH level difference, and that is protective in some cases for protein malnutrition. But if it's that far uh, uh, away from um, uh, or that close, let's say, to the uh, terminal part of the ileum, uh, it can become a serious problem. So in theory, if you look at it, these are actually the things that might be uh, more of a risk of developing after a BPDS compared to a CDS. So weighing that scale again of weight loss compared to actual uh, um, negative results in terms of um, uh, um, micronutrient uh, deficiencies uh, might tend to have uh, a, a preference for the CDS. Now, if you look at the long-term outcomes of uh, malabsorptive surgery, are the risks thus outweighing or the benefits outweighing the risks? Now, if you look at the results here, you see that actually the, uh, the amount of deficiencies of the BPDS, even in the long-term, are quite severe. These are nutritional deficiencies on the left here for, let's say, uh, vitamin D and especially zinc, as you can see, and fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, keep uh, remaining a problem even after 10 years. And these are deficiencies that keep on coming, keep on coming. And it's not always the same patient. And look at what happens actually at the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right here. As you can see that even within a year, over 50%, it's even, what is it, around 70% of people have one or more deficiencies already, already that they didn't have before surgery. Is that the same for, for uh, uh, the CDS? Well, it's a little bit challenging because in the CDS, we were at the uh, brink, let's say, of good multivitamins and advising calcium vitamin D. And I must say that it's pretty hard to compare pears and apples. Um, but as you can see here, especially for, the, for vitamin A, vitamin B1, vitamin B6, it seems to be quite well doable to prevent those uh, after um, uh, a mean three years of people developing new deficiencies. And it keeps on developing, of course, because every time that new um, multivitamins or uh, sorry, studies come out, the multivitamins uh, nowadays are altered to the needs of the patient. I try to make a comparison here of what I could find in literature about uh, the comparison about the renal I guess, bypass, well known to most of the uh, viewers here, of course. Uh, many practices uh, still do a lot of renal I guess, bypasses, and then comparing them to the two procedures we're talking about here, to so the CDS and the BPDDS. And as you can see, and unfortunately my screen is not uh, working completely here, uh, but as you can see, the BPDDS has the tendency to have much more deficiencies than the other two, but the CDS also has a high number of deficiencies or actually percentage of deficiencies. Now, what actually happens after the BPDDS? In general, people tend to eat a third less. A sleeve in a BPDDS and a CDS is a device not to make to be as, as a primary procedure, not to be made as tight as a, a standard sleeve because you are, um, you have to be able to eat at least a little bit of food because of the huge bypass, which is really malabsorptive, not hypoabsorptive. Passage times do change. In most cases, passage times, times increase after uh, BPDDS and sleeve surgery. And of course, because of the very much uh, uh, the, the large reduction in stomach size, you will see that the average volume uh, of um, uh, gastric acid produced is only around 20%. 
intrinsic factor, although it's still in the uh, pylorus available, it is much less. We do not know relatively how much, but it's less. And if you look a little bit further, of course, the duodenum is bypassed. There's a new sort of duodenum de novo, let's say. And absorption over there is not as good, for example, for ferritin as the original duodenum is. And because of the altered pH levels, because on average pH levels will um, increase, uh, decrease, sorry, I have to be uh, uh, honest there, <laughs> it decreases a little bit. It is getting harder for some and easier for others to get absorbed. Now, the preoperostasis is most important, perhaps, especially if it's a second procedure after a sleeve, for example. It is all about, and let's focus here on the, on the fat-soluble vitamins, um, the muscle, the liver, the fat soluble, uh, the, and the fat around the organs is actually quite a large storage site for fat soluble vitamins. And I've shown this before, but if you would be able to pour all that fat mass from that lean patient on the left and that right patient uh, on the, and the patient here on the right into a measuring cup, you would have some sort of uh, 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 difference in the total amount of fat. Now, if you would try to supplement this patient or get them up to speed to a normal, let's say, vitamin A level, and you would put the same dose in, the, in both measuring cups, then, of course, the amount, the general amount of uh, vitamin A in those different serums uh, and fat mass will differ. So you would require, on average, more fat-soluble vitamins to get that serum level in a normal range. The difference between CDS and BPDDS is that it seems that the CDS is, uh, la has less uh, uh, issues in absorbing those fat-soluble vitamins. But still, 12% of patients, uh, and those are patients not using retinol in this case, but actually the uh, patients that use uh, only uh, beta-carotene, uh, do develop vitamin A deficiency. That makes sense because some people cannot convert beta-carotene to retinol, so they always will uh, have lower intakes of vitamin A. Um, but look at what, what the BPDDS does on average. The amount of deficiencies is much higher. And I'm going to reassure you because vitamin K shown here is vitamin K1 and not vitamin K2. So in practice, those BPDDS patients do not have um uh issues in their um what's it called uh their clotting let's say so aptt and ptt are still normal and that is because of the growth of the bacteria in the large colon that make up with vitamin k2 there so in my practice what do i test preoperatively in these patients the list is sometimes a little bit longer uh, but as you can see, looking at uh, ferritin and hemoglobin on the left and the uh, the the blood type i need for surgery from albumin, calcium, and vitamin D, sometimes the magnesium, if they do not take that as a, uh, um, a supplement and it's not in their food habits, let's say zinc and ferritin, folic acid, vitamin B12. And if people have the tendency to vomit a lot, I always measure vitamin B1. Surprisingly, how many people have a low or subclinically low level. And of course, depending on their uh, comorbidities, um, the cholesterol, for example, glucose, et cetera. Um, look at your lab reference levels. Very important because still there's a lot of hospitals in the world that do not look at, let's say, the BMI of the patient and then the reference levels used are for patients with a normal BMI, let's say. So ranges do differ, for example, for ferritin. Now, postoperatively, um, you test pretty much the same, actually, um, depending on how the patient's feeling. I think the biggest difference is in whether patients are compliant to multivitamins and the calcium, or they are non-compliant. In a compliant patients with the multivitamins that we have nowadays, you can actually be satisfied with a scheme like zero. If they're deficient, you do another. For example, if there's a deficiency for ferritin, you measure after treating patients. If that's all right, you go to 12, 24. And if that's okay, you just do it every other year. If that patient is non-compliant, so keep asking whether patients are compliant or not. You actually go to this scheme. So zero, zero again, sometimes the three, uh, depending on their clinical status. So vomiting, for example, 6, 12, 18, 24, et cetera, et cetera. So many more tests for that patient who is not compliant. The ideal setup to look at what is required is, of course, if you would be able to do a good randomized trial, 
um, in which you use a standard multivitamin and a specialized one, and you keep on measuring at a certain time frame. If you have the differences in levels um, compared to the uh, zero line, uh, you can actually calculate what should be in it to come up with a, a specific uh, treatment for that patient. But on average, um, you want to have a good basic, so a good specialized multivitamin for your patient. Um, and if that's not available, then sometimes uh, pharmacists can make them for you. So this is what I would advise for the uh, CDS uh, on the left here and uh, for the BPDDS on the right. And as you can see, there's uh, uh, quite a lot of similarities, actually, but a lot of differences in terms of um, uh, the amounts of uh, fat soluble vitamins. Uh, and especially we uh, supplement our patients with additional vitamin K1, not for the clinical signs, but because the lab levels are in so many cases so low. Treatment of patients is pretty, pretty hard in this group because everything seems to interact. So let's take ferritin. So I want to supplement my patients with iron. The big issue is that you have to give a high dose of iron, and that means you also have to sometimes supplement with zinc because it counteracts. If you give a high dose of zinc, then the big issue is that you also need a high dose of copper um, because that interacts as well. It, it uses the same carrier over the lumen. And that, unfortunately, in a low dose, again, influences ferritin. Calcium blocks that sometimes depending on the form. So not all calcium does that, but still, in general, I always tell calcium has the tendency to bind with some of the complexes here. Uh, 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 manganese in a high dose influences ferritin as well. These are positive influencers. Uh, it itself negatively influences the uptake of vitamin B6. And another example is that we give high doses of folic acid. So it's, sorry, it's B9 in the US, but in Europe it's B11, uh, similar vitamin, it's folic acid and vitamin B12, but if you give high doses of that, you will definitely get a high dose of vitamin B6 because it's co-carried across the membrane. So high levels of vitamin B6 are something to be worried about, especially if you look at the situation in, for example, uh, Australia, in which uh, vitamin B6 uh, is, is supplemented in anything, tea and whatever. So you see very high doses there of vitamin B6, and that tends to have a, a neurogenic effect in very high doses. So my recommendations, quite simple, test preoperatively. The preoperative status is what makes that patient in the first year with a BPDDS and a SADS. Of course, you have to look at the surgery type because not all BPDDSs are BPDDSs. The one common channel of a, a meter uh, is different from the one of 150 in which you will have a lower amount of, let's say, albumin or protein deficiencies. Truly, screen, 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 and keep screening. If you're not sufficient, keep calling that patient back. And again, prevention, prevention, and all the way on. Prevention is the thing. You don't want to see those very poorly treated health patients. You just don't want to have any deficiencies. Um, small ones or, or low ones uh, are not that bad. But if a patient doesn't come in for many, many years, you have to actively call these patients because sometimes they are worse off than you might think behind your desk. And again, check compliance. Every time you speak to that patient, do check whether they are using what you ask them to. Thank you so much for your attention. This was my part of this excellent session. I already know because there's great speakers coming up. I'm looking forward to listening to them and hopefully afterwards we get a lot of questions. Thanks. Well, I believe I'm I'm here to talk, make the first question to you, Edo. Very nice presentation. And I do quite have some experience with glutinol switches. We started doing it back in 97 with Professor Marchesini and then gone away with my cases. But one thing I would like to ask you about the technique. Do you believe that Dr. Hess, when imagined the first surgery and his next publications, he proposed making measuring the whole length of the bowel and using a proportion of it as a common uh, uh, limb, trying to avoid uh, these complications, severe complications. Do you have any thought about this? 
Um, there's a couple of surgeries actually that that have to have this idea. Uh, so there's now a very nice study in the Netherlands that actually measures the the total length and then does a percentage in OHBs, uh, and it doesn't seem to make any difference in outcomes at least, and not even in complications. If because you you calculate from uh, the uh, the the valve, let's say backwards, it might not really be necessary. Uh, because uh, if you look at the cadaver studies coming from, I think it was Israel, you see that if you look at the lumen after a couple of years in these patients, uh, after, for example, room y gastric bypass surgery, you see that the uh, villi are, have grown like immensely. So the absorption capacity is maximized for what is possible. So I think, um, but it's just theory that in a BPDDS, it might not be as important as with uh, uh, surgeries that you calculate from the front, let's say from trice, compared to calculating from the back in a BPDDS. But it's just my own theory. So I can't uh, um, uh, um, be 100% sure. One thing that you might uh, know if you would calculate everything is that in a BPDS, you have a very long um, limb in which only, uh, so the biliary limb in which only the uh, gall and the uh, AMLS uh, uh, passes. And of course, you can have much more uh, bacteri bacterial overgrowth in there. So many more complaints if you know that that limb is relatively longer. But it's the only thing I can think of that that might be of benefit in that case. Thank you. I think, Scott, you should have a question. Yeah, I do. Uh, a question and a comment. Ido, first of all, great presentation. You take a difficult topic and make it sound easy. Uh, my comment is to the last thing we discussed. Uh, if you look in the literature, measuring bowel is extremely inaccurate. And that's another problem we face is you may say it was 200 centimeters, but it could have been 280 or 300. One study demonstrated that we un, we overestimate by 60% in some cases. So whatever you think the bowel length is, it may not be. My second, uh, my question is, I was dabbling in doing uh, distal gastric bypasses and uh, did a number of them on people I thought were the best candidates, the smartest patients, that I had discussed the issues with them over and over and over and over preoperatively, my dietitians over and over and over. And they did great for a couple of years. And then several of them came back with just incredibly severe deficiencies that we had to do trials of TPN and ultimately reversed some of them and partially reversed the rest. One of the things, because you talked about compliance and these people I would have thought were great candidates is cost. And maybe that's the problem that these people are not telling us, but they can't afford the hundred dollars or hundred euros a month to buy all of these vitamins. Uh, so maybe you can comment on that. And also along those same lines is, is there intolerance to taking so many tablets and, and capsules at one time or throughout the day that it upsets their stomach or some other reason they don't do it? Professor Shikora, thank you so much for the uh, the comments. Um, I think you are spot on. Um, first of all, let me let me uh, uh, go into the, the last question. Yes, many people uh, have issues in having four or five moments a day taking calcium, multivitamins, etc. Et that makes it very very difficult for that patient to hold on to that for years and years to come. As I've shown you, after ten years, fifteen years, even those patients that have the tendency to make new deficiencies. Um, so uh, compliance is not just short-term, it is long-term and it is hard. We are human and we have the tendency if things, uh, to, to stop doing things if we don't like them. And I must say, if you, have you ever tasted the calcium tablets? I, I, would, I would not be able to do it the rest of my life. Uh, luckily, we have better products coming out, but still, if you have to take that the rest of your life, it's it's like cr chewing on a crayon every time, three times a day. It is not much fun. Um, and the multivitamins on average are, uh, although they have uh, all sorts of tastes like cherry and whatever, they 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 ha they have a sort of bitterness, uh, a bitter taste afterwards. So, um, and that has to do with the the high uh, amount of of B vitamins, of course, in it. 
Um, so yeah, compliance is a difficult thing. Cost is a difficult thing as well. Um, you, if if you're unable to pay that amount, it's 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 getting harder and harder every year to spend your money on that as well. Yeah. So um, oh, it's a good remark. I mean, the smartest people on average know what to do, uh, but then doing it is a whole different story. And coming back to the to the first remark you made about bowel length, uh, I always when I do redo surgery, I always remeasure everything to see whether I measured right the the first time. In all those cases, I've never had a hundred percent score about what I've measured. It's on average indeed longer uh, than what I measured the first time. Uh, so the, the the craziest one was a uh, hundred centimeter biliary length that in the end was two meters sixty. I don't know how. But it happens. I mean, um, you you can be sure what you are actually measuring. That is true. Just just reaffirming what I asked because there are some papers now being published that folks that are trying to measure by CT scan that uh, will be the more natural way to measure it because every time you manipulate the the ball, it changes its size. That's uh, the reason I asked. I think there's a lot to study about uh, measuring. Balls from here to It'd now. It'd be interesting to see if the insurance companies will pay for the CAT scans just to measure the bowel length. I think that might be a fight we'll have to deal with one day. Well, if you show the, the outcome for, for the years for the problems that we are causing, actually, we're talking about malnutrition and problems. Maybe we can justify uh, maybe measuring it to avoid these complications that eventually will bring to the patient. And the patient is the final the final uh, one that's going to suffer or not what we are doing to them. I think Marco has a last question to go to. Edo, congratulations for your excellent presentation. Uh, I completely agree with you. Prevention is the main thing of treatment of these kind of these group of patients. Um, other way supplementation is always important, but at some cases that require conversion. Uh, my question is, is there any difference between say this and uh, do then a switch first? And if we have to convert, which procedure we should do? Thank you so much, Marco. And it, uh, again, good to see you uh, here. And do you mean uh, the conversion? If, 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 if somebody has a protein deficiency, uh, like the malnutrition, whatever, what should we do after say the yes. essence? Okay, so what we what we uh, tend to do is actually uh, increase the common channel quite severely sometimes depending on the, how, but the big issue is if it's a protein a protein deficiency we're talking about, uh, I always find that so hard to, to time that right. I mean, if the, I mean the, the chances of leakage with, with low albumin levels or to, I mean, supplementing these patients in the beginning is sometimes very hard. So, uh, uh, and of course, in these cases, you do not have a remnant stomach. So you can't, you can't just put in a, a feeding tube uh, uh, through the abdominal wall. Uh, uh, so, People are sometimes walking around with feeding tube through their nose for months and months before you can actually do the redo surgery. So the the um, the uh, consequences for the patients is is sometimes pretty hard. But on average, um, you I, I found articles be, read uh, that I read through. You you can apparently uh, uh, convert uh, CDs and BPDDSs into anything uh, because they just reattach. Uh, what I, I would not advise that because. On average, you do those revisions in patients that have a problem in terms of nutrition. So my advice would always be, uh, be to elongate, let's say, the common channel uh, in total. So not just the elementary limb, but come up in BPDDSs as well by uh, uh, um, elongating it. So in, for example, uh, what you saw that uh, what Antonio did with his uh, SARDSs, he, he was doing 250, uh, but just adding 50 centimeters to that actually uh, cut that number of or percentage of patients with uh, protein malnutrition going from around 10% to only 2%. So although it's only 50 centimeters, now the standard is three meters in the CDS and fortunately, luckily I do not have to do that many uh, revisional procedures anymore after that change. Unfortunately, I have. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that so is terrible. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah. Thanks so much. So thank you, Edu. I think we're going to go to the next topic and I should present uh, the next topic and the presenter. We're going to have an update on identification of specific nutritional deficiencies after CDS and BPDDS by Dr. Lillian Craig-Dino. 
She's a bariatric dietitian and support group coordinator for Cleveland Cleveland for Florida USA, a doctorate degree in health administration for the University of Phoenix and master of science degree in dietetics and nutrition from Florida International University, adjunct assistant professor at Nova Southeastern University College of Osteopathic Medicine Nutrition Program and Allopathic Medical School in Florida. Executive Council of the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Integrated Health Committee, past co-chair of the SMBS Integrated Health Committee, Florida, Puerto Rico, and Caribbean chapter, and associated editor for the journal Surgery of Obesity and Related Disease, also known as SWAR. Thank you, Dr. Lillian, please. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this esteemed group. Thank you, Dr. Harris, for the invitation. I'm just overwhelmed. Let me share my screen. So I am going to echo a lot of what Dr. Arts was saying, go into a little bit more detail, but give it to you from the perspective of a nutritionist. So we're going to talk about the identification of specific nutritional deficiencies after Sadie and BPDDS. These are my disclosures, none of which will affect my presentation today. So hopefully after this presentation, we'll be able to identify and update the potential for which specific nutritional deficiencies after Sadie and after BPDDS. And with that information, this is what I do to utilize what kind of dosages to recommend to my patients. So I think one of the challenges as a nutritionist is that we have these endorsed procedures and devices, but you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we're coming up so fast with these procedures that we're not keeping up with the guidelines. So we might have you know, a SADI procedure, but then now I'm a nutritionist trying to help somebody with a SADI, but I don't have a lot of guidance in terms of, this, of the CPGs. I mean, prior to 2008, we dietitians were bumping around in the night just trying to um, collate what diet and what vitamins other surgical procedures might have entailed in order to help our patients. And then when you look at even the sleeve gastrectomy prior to 2016, there was nothing even for the sleeve. So are we in the same boat with Sadie? Now, of course, when you look at the current guidelines, we do have information on BPDDS and some of the recommendations that I know uh, Sylvia will be talking about. But are these recommendations actually accurate and do we need to revise these? And I'm saying yes. So I have to say, Dr. Arts, I got to give you a shout out. You are my hero. I have to say that when I was helping my sleeve patients before any kind of guidelines, I just really relied on the research that you published to say, look, let's take a more aggressive approach when it comes to vitamin and mineral supplementation for our patients, because I want to prevent these deficiencies, like you said, not try to treat deficiency diseases that sometimes will be irreversible. So I just want to give you a shout out. So thank you so much. So are we going to be saying the same thing for SADS? So there are a lot of general comments out there. We do know that micronutrient deficiencies are more common after something that's more malabsorptive or hypoabsorptive. Uh, so we know that. And, you know, the latest comment from my friend, Dr. O'Kane, of course, is saying, well, should we actually look at Sadie and treat it in terms of supplementation very similar to BPD? And again, more comments about how we know that there might be less risk of protein malnutrition and micronutrient deficiencies, but nevertheless, there are deficiencies and risk of deficiencies. And if we're talking about prevention, that's really what we need to be you know, focusing on. So as a nutritionist, what I try to do is understand a little bit of the anatomy between the two surgeries, because I have to go back to my A&P lesson to decide, okay, where are things absorbed? Where are things malabsorbed? You know, what might actually be um, affecting that in terms of even just the patient individuality, their BMIs, their food intake, their food security, their ability to access micronutrient deficiencies. So all of this comes into play when we decide what dosages do we recommend for our patients. I also go back to the research to see, well, what risks are there? 
with and without supplementation. So when we look at some of the literature, we see and we know that with the duodenal switch, if these patients don't have supplementation, there is very high risk of uh, deficiencies, especially of the fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin B12 is a little bit less and that's probably because of the storage of vitamin B12, but we have to be very cautious with this too because is this actually usable vitamin B12? And of course, when you look at some of our minerals like copper and zinc, and I didn't put selenium up here, but that's also very high. And then what's a little disheartening is again, with supplementation, with some of these guidelines that we have, we're still seeing deficiencies in fat soluble vitamins. And again, those zinc and iron, and along with that will come the deficiency diseases. So whether we're looking at kind of in the first year or even longer, we're still seeing the deficiencies. Now, this was interesting too, the hypervitaminosis found in vitamin B1 and B6. I do agree with that B6, being very careful with that. With vitamin B1, there is no toxicity. So I tend to be a little bit more aggressive even with my B1s because I'd rather have in a, a high B1 rather than a low B1 because the consequences of that is very severe. And again, concentrating on the patient's compliance and their symptoms, if they're having a lot of wasting in terms of vomiting, diarrhea, et cetera, that B1 is going to waste pretty quickly. And then looking as you progress through the years, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Or is it staying the same? And it looks like some things get worse and some things stay the same and some things might get a little bit better, but we still have to focus on those fat soluble vitamins, calcium, zinc, and iron. So again, this seems to be the common theme. And looking at even, this is a five-year data looking out of uh, New Zealand. What are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing that deficiency rates might go down for some of these things, but we have to also take into consideration insufficiency. I don't like that word insufficiency because that's just a couple, you know, milligrams away from a deficiency. So we have to take that very serious as, as well. So again, what are we seeing? The fat soluble vitamins, we're seeing calcium. Interestingly, the folate and the B12 didn't seem to be too much of an issue. And then just moving on more to nine years with the P BPD, we're actually seeing an increase in protein deficiency. We're seeing an increase in zinc. Again, we're seeing iron, low hemoglobin, low hematocrit, which is anemia. We're seeing calcium deficiency actually increase. Uh, B1 seemed to be stable, B12, et cetera. So even long-term, we're not really taking care of some of these deficiencies, even with supplementation, they're getting worse. And again, we can go on and on with even some of the most current information. Again, we're seeing the same anemia, vitamin K, vitamin D. So here we go again. So really as a summary for BPDDS, what is the risk, right? So even with long-term supplementation, we're still seeing a long-term risk of protein deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, iron deficiency, ferritin deficiency, vitamin A, vitamin K, zinc, perhaps vitamin B1 in some studies, and elevated PTH, which we know is going to lead eventually to metabolic bone disease, anemia, and of course, quality of life issues as well perhaps a lower risk for vitamin B12. It almost makes me think, did we get the recommendation right by recommending B12 injection once a month? Maybe. Does it have to do with the anatomy and physiology of some storage of vitamin B12? Maybe. Folic acid, that I was actually surprised because when you also see the intake of these patients, folic acid, natural folate is found in plant products. And that's not a very easy food to eat after bariatric surgery. Vitamin E, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, that might be a lower risk. And we do have to be careful of that hypervitaminosis of vitamin B6, because of course I do agree with Dr. Arts that that is neurotoxic. Now, when we look at SADI and BPD as a comparison, yes, as a comparison, I do agree that the sadi might show slightly lower risk for some of these fat-soluble vitamins, calcium, iron, et cetera. But again, nevertheless, there is deficiency. And again, when you do this comparison, this is just showing from the 2022, it is less, significantly less when you look at the numbers. But when you look at the person, if they're having that deficiency, 
that's going to be, you know, a major risk in their quality of life. So I do agree with the statement that it may be more appropriate conclusion to say SADS has fewer malabsorptive complications than DS, but we still have to conclude that by saying, but there still is risk and deficiencies. So even at the five year, when you just look at the SADI, we are seeing even with supplementation, we're still having problems with calcium, parathyroid hormone, albumin. I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, protein, vitamin E, that actually worsened over time. Vitamin A and vitamin K actually also worsened in this study, although it wasn't statistically significant. And there was a higher risk for copper and zinc deficiency still a risk for that anemia and metabolic bone disease. So as a nutritionist, I'm trying to look at this not just as, you know, one point in time, is it going to be a risk of vitamin A? If it's a risk of vitamin A, let me see if I can treat that to prevent that vitamin A deficiency from becoming a deficiency disease. So the latest if so statement, um, nutritional issues um, are included now because we have some, you know, medium term information on SADI that there is presence of malabsorption, hypoalbuminemia, iron deficiency, hypocalcemia, low vitamin D, hyperparathyroidism. Um, there are nutritional deficiencies that are emerging. So this is something that we nutritionists really have to pay attention to, to try to prevent it. The question is, what do we recommend? Do we recommend the same dosages as BPD, DS? You know, we still have to really look into the literature to see what would our initial recommendations be. It seems to be common thought amongst my colleagues to actually be a bit aggressive with Sadie and try to make the, almost the similar recommendations as BPD. So really my conclusions to my presentation would be, we know that metabolic and bariatric surgery is a durable treatment for obesity, but it absolutely is not without nutritional risk. We can say that the SADI versus the duodenal switch appears to offer less risk of nutritional deficiencies, but we still have to say, look, deficiencies are seen in both. And as a registered and licensed dietitian, what my number one goal is, is to identify what some of these deficiencies are prior to surgery. I want to really aggressively try to treat those and, and correct them, and then still know that after surgery, there's going to be risk of these vitamin deficiencies. Um, I think lifelong follow-up is something that we all have to work on. Uh, interdisciplinary collaboration between the practitioners, including the nutritionists, definitely a patient-centered approach. We can look at all of this research and look at it from you know, a global perspective, but when you have a single patient in front of you that has a risk of, you know, night blindness because the vitamin A deficiency, that's going to be on that individual. Optimization of nutrition status, I don't think enough attention is um, being brought to that. I think we really have to take our time sometimes with these patients and really optimize them before they get into the surgery. Continuing patient education and counseling is absolutely necessary because I do agree. I think some of our patients are going to be compliant in the short term, but it's also the long term that's going to show these potential problems. And again, these could be irreversible. And of course, continuing research and better quality of research and education of we practitioners should definitely be ongoing. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. I have a lot of references and additional reading for your pleasure. And I would love to keep the dialogue going. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lillian. What an excellent talk again. I've seen many already. And of course, you are on, let's say, almost every paper on the subject. So uh, <laughs> giving a shout out to me, it should be the other way around. Oh, so uh, thank you that. so much again. My pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, a BPDDS from a nutritional standpoint, is it still with the alternatives that are out there ethically in your mind allowed to give that to a patient? <laughs> Thank you for asking me that question. As a nutritionist, you know, I don't have much of a, a role in making that decision. Of course, it's the surgeon's call. However, if I'm doing a pre-assessment of a patient and I see that they're going to exhibit even more risk because of their health behaviors or potential for non-compliance, I am going to talk to the surgeon and say, oh, this might not be the best procedure for this particular patient. And then we'll have our interdisciplinary collaboration to make that decision. Um, you know, just from a personal perspective, if I have a patient with a BPD, I really insert myself as much as I can to help that patient 
almost ad nauseum because you know I want to make sure that they're okay not just for the first year so I think it is about developing relationships um, a lot of our patients after the surgery they love their surgeons but then after that it's all about nutrition care and psych care so I really try to insert myself long term <laughs> Well, you, you, I think you are uh, 100% completely right, but uh, uh, don't be so modest, let's say, because uh, <laughs> surgeons are also humans. <laughs> so uh, if, I mean, your, your vote in this is, is perhaps much greater than you might yeah. think, uh, yeah. because a surgeon is only part of that patient's life for yeah. a very small period. And yeah. as you are already explaining very clearly, your role and the role of the rest of your multidisciplinary team is much greater. Yeah. And that one is very important, but your vote or your voice must be heard in when you choose for these kind of procedures. Thank so you. Uh, put yourself up there and shout out much harder sometimes. <laughs> that you is know, very important, Lillian. My saying usually to, to a lot of these surgeons are, are we creating a situation that's even worse? Are we exchanging one terrible problem of obesity for something that might be even worse, night blindness? So now we've treated the obesity and the patient might you know, be at a more normal BMI, but now they're in a wheelchair or they're blind or they have peripheral neuropathy. So did we really help that patient? So yeah, do no harm, right? Isn't that our first tenant? So yeah, I do agree. So I do insert myself. That's <laughs> Thanks good. doc. That's good. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Lillian. Uh, Professor Shikora, I think you're up next for the next question. Also, great presentation. Uh, you, I, we all agree a lot with what you said. One thing to mention is the legal ramifications of these vitamin deficiencies. Yeah. You yeah. send a patient home, they don't take their vitamins, they don't come back to see you, you call them and they still don't come in. And when they develop their night blindness or their diplopia, or the other conditions, you're going to find yourself in court yeah. one day. And a lot of the uh, malpractice suits, particularly in the United States, are becoming nutritional, where in yeah. the past they were leaks. Uh, anyway, my question, Lillian, is chronic noncompliance. We all face it in patients, whether it's they can't afford it, or it's inconvenient, or they forget. I know you're not a surgeon, so I'm not asking you about when do you reverse these. But how would you manage the chronically noncompliant patient, the one who comes back every few months with the derangements and you spend a lot of time correcting them and they go out, numbers look better, and then they come back with the same issues six months later uh -huh. and you're back to square one. Uh, right. What do you do with that type of patient from a dietitian standpoint? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Shakur. And you know, you're my hero too, you know that. Um, you know, and thank you for making that comment about the, the legal ramifications as well, as I do serve as expert witness for a lot of these cases. Um, if I have a patient that is chronic, if they're coming back, I'm really excited about that because at least that patient is coming back for me to reassess what's going on. But in addition to finding out what's going on, we might need to go beyond the labs we, not, we need to look at food security, food insecurity, um, support systems, financial aspects. So what I try to do is this has to be a collaborative team. I need to talk with and have the patient talk with my psychologist, my exercise physiologist, the bariatricians. This needs to be a group to find out what is up with this chronic non-compliance. Is it a nutritional issue where every time they take them, they're getting sick? Is it a different issue that I need to include my social worker because they just can't afford to buy these supplements? So I need to find a way to help them with that. Is it a medical surgical reason? Is it, you know, um, something with their new medications that might be causing more of a malabsorption? So I think this really is a team approach. We have to find the root cause of what's going on, not just assume the patient's being non-compliant just to be non-compliant. We have to find out why and then try to help them moving forward. Does that make sense? Yes. And it also demonstrates the complexity of the process yes. that you have to include many other people and have so much that you're going to have to work your, your way yeah. through social workers, maybe behavioral therapists, surgeons. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Well, Liam, thank you for your presentation. Excellent. Thank um, you. All the discussion is... Uh, around the importance of the multidisciplinary team decision. So it's not only surgeon decision. 
what kind of surgery we have to perform for particular patients. In this context, in this context, in order to to avoid the disaster we are talking about, uh, how do you feel? How, what do you think about preoperative counseling? How we can select patient for malabsorbent procedure? Yeah, I love that question. Important. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think patient selection is so important, no matter which metabolic and bariatric surgery the patient's moving forward with. So as a nutritionist, my role would be to optimize their nutritional status because we know that obesity is a form of malnutrition. So that would be my role. I want to see what is the nutritional status of this patient and try to get them prepared for surgery. So in that case, we might have to take a slower time from patient selection to patient surgery. And I know that there are some facilities where we got to get these patients through and that might not be the best decision, you know, to do that. So I want to be able to take my time with these patients, of course, being realistic, and then of course, work with the rest of the team. So I do agree that free optimization is very important. Getting that that patient really prepared, not just nutritionally, but all the other factors that we had mentioned. But yeah. Yes. Counseling is most important thing before. Yes. Yes, education and counseling, yes. Well, thank you so much, Lillian, uh, for all the answers here. Um, great, again, and very good to meet you. We'll meet up in person uh, in, the, in the, the very short future. <laughs> and now, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we will. Now, introducing somebody who actually knows a lot, a lot, a lot about this subject, and I'm very happy to introduce is uh, Dr. Silvia Leitefaria uh, from Brazil. Uh, she's going to talk us through the comprehensive nutritional supplementation after SADS and BPDDS. Dr. Sylvia Leitefaria um, has a PhD and master's in human nutrition, is vice chair of the ISO Integrated Health Committee, a member of the American Dietitians Association, and a researcher at the beautiful capital of Brazil, the University of Brasilia. Take the floor, Dr. Sylvia. <laughs> Thank you for this kind introduction, Dr. Arts. I'm glad to be here. I'm honored to be part of this renowned team of experts. And I'm gonna talk about the comprehensive nutritional supplementation after SADS BPDDS procedures. So I have no disclosures. Well, I have learned a lot with my colleagues here and, and both procedures are hypoabsorptive procedures. And uh, because they are hypoabsorptive procedures, they, they lead to increased risk of vitamins and other micronutrient deficiencies. The two, two main causes, the exclusion of jejunal contact with nutrients can result in poor absorption of iron, selenium, copper, B12, and zinc. And short common channel affects the absorption of soluble, sol soluble vitamins and uh, the, the movement of bowels also interferes. So steatorrhea, diarrhea can lead to increased fat soluble vitamins malabsorption or hypoabsorption. Patients are advised to adhere to multivitamin lifelong as we have seen here. The necessity of specific vitamins and mineral supplementations can be many times higher than other bariatric procedures when we talk about the sleeve gastrectomy or runway gastric bypass. The minimal daily nutritional supplementation for a hypoabsorptive procedure is 200% of daily value within the multivitamin plus additional doses of iron, thiamine, calcium, vitamin A, DAC, and vitamin B12. Um, regular exams and clinical evaluation are two cornerstones, and we should adjust according to the need that comes along with this clinical evaluation. Um, I brought this review of my colleague, uh, 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 Dr. Mary O'Kane, and here in this, re in this review paper, she, she shows that uh, Sadie Diaz and Duodeno Switch has increased nutritional deficiencies when we talk about protein and fat soluble vitamins, iron, zinc, copper, selenium. And uh, when I'm going to talk about uh, dosage, I will focus on also this um, guideline that has recommended for SADI and BPDDS almost the same uh, amounts of vitamins and minerals. 
So we know that for as a nutritional recommendation, 200% of daily value of all of vitamins and minerals are, are recommended uh, with some additional doses for this 12 here that I'm going to talk about. The first one is thiamine. Uh, we should use a complete multivitamin with adequate amount of thiamine that can uh, the multivitamin can can come along with 12 to 50 milligrams of thiamine daily. The first month is a, is a um, very important point because with the rapid weight loss, patients can present some signs and symptoms of thiamine deficiency, and it can damage the central nervous system. So we should give additional doses if, if your patient is presenting nausea or um, vomiting or uh, some neurological damage. And we should treat it very soon because lab exams are not very reliable. So if you suspect your patient presents thiamine deficiency, you should give additional doses. Also, we know that these patients can present bacteria overgrowth over time. So this is another risk factor for thiamine deficiency. Just be aware you are treating thiamine adequately. Uh, vitamin B12 does not present any increase in these two procedures. The doses will vary depending on the route of administration, signs and symptoms, and also lab exams. We can use oral doses and also parenteral doses every three months or monthly doses. In case of, in case of deficiency, we can use uh, daily doses sublingually or we, you, we can use uh, some uh, intramuscular doses of B12. Uh, iron is another concern. The multivitamin should have at least 40 to uh, 65 milligrams of uh, elemental iron daily. But the studies have shown that with one year, 60% of patients can present iron deficiency, iron deficiency even with the use of the multivitamin. So in a no-risk population, population such as postmenopausal women and men, we can go up to 100 milligrams per day. And we should think about uh, intravenous supplementation in uh, uh, mm, no. women at a fertile age that can be done once or twice a year. Folate, the, the dosage does not increase, it's the same for other procedures. Women at a, at a fertile age or a childbearing age should take uh, higher doses. Zinc can be a concern due to the presence of diarrhea. Staturia can increase the risk because of the losses through the gastrointestinal tract. Hair loss and alteration in taste can be signs and symptoms of zinc deficiency. Among this population, we should start with 30 milligrams per day within the multivitamin. In case of deficiency, we can go up to 40 to 100 milligrams daily. Just be aware you, you are compensating the right amount of copper. For every 2 to 15 milligrams of zinc, we should give 1 milligram of copper. So increase in zinc can be uh, leading to copper deficiency, and the opposite is also true. Copper, we should start with two milligrams per day within the multivitamin. You, you can consider increasing the doses. If the patient presents deficiency, you can go up to 80 milligrams, eight milligrams per day. The upper level is 10. Copper in the form of gluconate or citrate is better digested, better tolerated among metabolic and bariatric surgery patients. Selenium is a concern among these this patients. The basic doses is 100 micro, micrograms per day. We can go up to 400. Some signs and symptoms are also can indicate selenium deficiencies, such as chronic diarrhea, metabolic bone disease, unexplained anemia, or cardiomyopathy. Levels of selenium are also uh, a good indicator. All of the Liposoluble vitamins are a concern. Vitamin A, we should start with 10,000 units per day. We can increase for higher weekly doses, but deficiency can occur uh, up to 40% of patients. Some countries, they, they have available water miscible form. I don't have it here um, very easily in my country. 
And diarrhea and steatorrhea uh, can increase the risk of vitamin A deficiency. So be aware you are checking symptoms of vitamin A deficiency. And the treatment in case of deficiency will depend on uh, presence or not of night blindness. So no corneal chains, you can go up to 25,000 for one to two weeks and then recheck uh, after three months. Uh, with corneal chains, you can go up to 100,000 units intramuscular doses for three days, followed by 50,000 units for two weeks. Vitamin D is a concern as uh, we have seen. So the basic doses are 7,000 units daily. We can go up to 50,000 one to three times a week. This is the basic doses. The objective is to check the 25 hydrox vitamin D. It should be higher than 30. You can use uh, higher doses daily, but if your patient is unresponsible to treatment, you can consider um, intramuscular injections of vitamin D. The recommended amount of calcium is 1,800 to 2,400. Uh, 2,000 is a minimum. Just consider increasing calcium if uh, your patient is presenting an increase of the parathormone with adequate amount of vitamin D. So they will, they will be um, prepared to receive increased doses of calcium and it, it can go up to 3,000 milligrams per day. Carbonate is, uh, can be used with meals and citrate with or without, it doesn't matter. The splitting into doses in, uh, is better for the absorption of calcium. Vitamin K, the basic doses or the initial doses, 300 micrograms per day. Deficiencies can be treated with higher doses. It is not very common among this population. However, pregnant woman, we should care about vitamin K because it can lead to bleeding problems, intracranial bleeding problems. So check uh, adequately vitamin K before. Uh, or, or as soon as possible. Chronic hypoabsorption should be treated, uh, maybe parenterally, and uh, recheck after three months. <clears throat> Vitamin E, the uh, initial dose is 100 units. Deficiencies can be treated up to 500 units per day. I found until 1,200 in the literature. If you are treating um, any of these vitamins, uh, recheck after three months. This is uh, um, challenging because sometimes patients, when they receive high doses of one vitamin, they think they will not need to repeat that uh, very soon because they, they are treated and we need to check lab exams. Uh, protein, as we saw here with, the, with the, my colleagues, is a concern. Protein hypoabsorption can occur. Uh, there is an increase due to the losses of the gastrointestinal tract. At least 30 grams are uh, lost uh, with the, uh, within the diarrhea. So uh, the basic doses of protein is 90 grams per day. It is increased when we talk about the other procedures that the minimal amount is 60 grams per day. And when the patient presents deficiency, we can go up to one gram 2.1 gram per kilogram of idea body weight. Additional protein supplementation may be needed, but we should find one that the patient tolerates in terms of taste and also digestion because this is, a, this is challenging sometimes when patient presents diarrhea and you increase protein and su protein supplements, some patients, uh, they will increase uh, um, also the, the diarrhea. This is a summary that I made with all of the nutrients that I have been talking about so with the recommended basic doses of this, this vitamins and also some recommended additional doses if your patient is presenting nutritional deficiencies. Uh, we know that diarrhea can increase if your patient is telling you that they present diarrhea, be you be concerned about some nutrients such as zinc, copper, selenium, and fat-soluble vitamins. And some, in some cases, the parenteral route is uh, also a recommendation if your patient is not responding well to the other ones. Some take-home messages. Long-term studies about nutritional deficiencies are needed, mainly among CGS patients. 
The most common deficiencies uh, related to vitamin A, D, iron, zinc, selenium, and protein. The presence of steatorrhea can interfere because it will increase the hypoabsorption of some nutrients. Regular biochemical assessment is recommended, rechecking after additional doses, and uh, most of studies recommend three months after. Patients' age, socioeconomic status, and responsibilities are key elements to avoid nutritional complications and non-adherence uh, for the with the supplementation and also with the biochemical evaluation can find uh, some nutritional consequences in, in the long term. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Silvia. Great presentation as always. And thank you. Uh, I would like to start asking you, well, in these cases, we do have a different patient. So BPDDS and SEDIS patients are different. What do you do your follow-up? How is your follow-up of these patients? Is it the same for the patients that do bypasses or you change the schedule? What do you do differently for these patients? Uh, from B B BPD to CDS? Yes, we, you see. Or from the renal, I guess, bypass. No, what we do, we're talking about CDS and with, you know, switch. So is the follow-up timing you do is the same for the patients with the bypass or you do something different? And how do you do that with these patients? Um, regularly, the uh, my I, when I presented my my speech, I I based it on the guidelines, and the guidelines uh, recommended the same nutritional supplementation for SAD as we don't have the SAD for a long term studies to base it on the same nutritional guidelines that we use for uh, DS for CDS. We know that there are little difference, but as uh, uh, Dr. Lillian told us we should prevent nutritional deficiencies. So if we are giving a little bit more for CDS procedure, probably we will uh, interfere in the hypoabsorption of some nutrients and you can prevent nutritional deficiencies as we don't have uh, long-term results uh, for nutritional guidelines for CDS. And for patients not compliant, do you uh, get worried about any patient overdoing the vitamins and you have any toxic problems with these patients because uh, the, of the... The key, the key point is, uh, as I, Dr. Uh, Edwards told us, the key point is the imbalance between minerals and vitamins and the, uh, the, how often they have to take and if they take everything at once. So all of these interferes, of course, when the patient is not compliant, well, I'm concerned about many, many things. Uh, uh, I can say that in DS and CD patients, I'm more concerned with the deficiencies, but the imbalance between the, the nutrients is, is also a, a problem. Thank you. Scott? Very nice presentation. Thank you very much. My head's exploding from all the knowledge that you gave us. I did a nutrition support fellowship with George Blackburn and Bruce Bistrian a million years ago and, our, and Carolina Povey and and our saying was always, if the gut works, use it. Uh, the question I have for you is that in this situation, we're dealing with people who have hypoabsorption, they get into trouble, and then we're going to now pound them with oral vitamins in a situation where they still have hypoabsorption and they may not do well absorbing it. I, we mentioned it just very briefly, but why don't we just give them a pick line and pound uh, vitamins into them intravenously, parenterally, tank them up faster, and then move on. I mean, we're all talking about oral intake here, but these patients failed oral intake. I, I, I totally agree. We have a lot of recommendations for oral doses and then increasing oral doses. And some papers have shown that even increasing oral doses, patients will present deficiency. So parenteral doses like monthly can prevent many uh, damages. So this is why on my last chart, the summary, I added the observation of the root, the parental root is an option. This is uh, important. Uh, my main concern when we talk about that is that when, when we talk about vitamins and minerals, they, they are 
uh, daily uh, recommendations we should take daily so i'm a little bit concerned telling people no you can just use parenteral doses and you're going to be okay there is no no problem because you 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 will observe everything and how about a daily doses of thiamine every day and b12 so uh, what I can think, thinking about making the patient's life easier, because we have to think about that, because sometimes it's very difficult to have all the follow-up that we are presenting here. It's very beautiful and a lot of data, but it is difficult to make it practical. And maybe a patient like that can use a very good multivitamin daily and sometimes use parenteral doses and check and like every three months, twice a year, once a year. Uh, this is, there is no consensus. I'm just giving my clinical and uh, my personal opinion, I can say, but I think it maybe it can work a little bit better than just be fighting with the patient to take like six, eight and 10 pills a day. So it's going to be uh, hard work. <laughs> Silvia, uh, thank you for your great presentation, very detailed. Uh, in my opinion, there is a very particular group of patients with malabsorbent procedures, which are the pregnant women. How we can manage that group of patients in order to avoid any problem for the newborns? Uh, this is a very good question. Thank you for your comment. Uh, this is this challenging to to take care of a pregnant woman when the among the literature. What I found two important. Uh, uh, points. The first one is vitamin A before the, the getting pregnant. Most some you know, multivitamins they have retinol as a vitamin A form, so this is can can damage, can be teratogenic for the baby. So changing for beta carotene is an option, but as we learned here today, not not all patients can uh, transform or, or make it available. So some. Some multivitamins, they have both um, retinol and beta carotene to increase the doses. I guess it is safer than just giving retinol or just giving beta carotene. And the other one is vitamin K. The deficiency can lead to intracranial bleeding and it can damage. So check before and just check in. Um, the blood exams are not so reliable. We have to ask for vitamin K, um, specifically vitamin K levels, and sometimes it is not covered by the health and the insurances. But this is another concern. And I guess if in your, in your country, if you have available water miscible form, it can be um, a good way to prevent those deficiencies. Iron deficiency is another problem, but it, it is all always with a pregnant a woman having bariatric surgery or not, protein is another key point. But I guess there's both vitamins I told you and, and folate that of course we need to increase. It is with all procedures and it should achieve at least one milligram per day. I have seen them to five, but it seems to interfere in the screening of B12. All right, well, let's move on. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the final speaker. I probably know you over 20 years uh, that we've been involved with courses and meetings. And uh, this is Dr. Jacqueline Jacks from the United States. She's gonna speak on the future of nutritional supplementation and monitoring. She's a well-known neuro, a naturopathic doctor with over 20 years of leadership experience in the medical nutrition and wellness industries co-founder of Bariatric Advantage, now a division of Metagenics, and the author of the book, uh, Micronutrition for the Weight Loss Surgery Patient. Jacqueline, welcome and uh, close out the session. Thank you, I really appreciate it. And it's such an honor to be here with this incredible panel. Um, I'm now gonna do my best possible job of sharing my screen. <laughs> Um, and uh, one moment because it needs to start here. Okay. So I always love when, um, when IBC gives me a topic like this. So I actually went back and I asked Harris, I said, um, am I, um, do you want me to focus this on the malabsorptive procedures? And he said, no, just do something, you know, general and, um, 
tell us about the future. So uh, to the best of my ability, as I'm able to see the future, which <laughs> is always a fun job to try and take a look at what's coming. Um, this is also my opportunity to tell you that I have nothing to disclose. So um, I'm going to keep this a little tight today. And really just in terms of monitoring, I'm going to focus on two things that I think stand out to me as um, current and, and future trends. So home testing, and I recognize today that I'm speaking to a very international audience and that um, regulations internationally regarding, you know, what kind of laboratory testings are um, restricted to a medical environment versus what is allowable for patients to conduct from the privacy of their own home varies greatly, but this is a huge trend that greatly accelerated during COVID of seeing laboratory testing available in patients' homes. Um, it is being done primarily at this point through blood and uh, spot urine testing, but there are some other systems that are um, starting to make their way uh, into patients' home as well. Um, I think there's pros and cons of these systems. So the pro, if there is one, I think especially for bariatric patients, is that home testing can really empower patients as individuals to engage more closely with their own care. So I've heard a lot of talk today about noncompliance. And I sometimes think one of the issues of noncompliance with nutrition is that um, you know, it, it doesn't always show up as something that people feel all the time. They might just be taking vitamins and you know, taking them and they're not getting any immediate feedback from that, right? It's not like you are sick and you take an antibiotic and suddenly you feel better. This is maintenance. So having an ability for um, home engagement um, that gives very quick feedback to patients, especially if they may not be doing, you know, nutritional testing, you know, more than once every year or two with their physician um, can be something potentially that keeps people much more engaged with the process and more able to identify a very early stage of deficiency that would then drive them in to see their doctor or dietitian. The cons, um, and I'll show a few more of these on the coming slides, these are not obviously complete panels because we don't have the the capability technology to do that um, in home tests at this point in time. Um, and some of these tests certainly lack the accuracy of the kinds of tests that you can order from your office. Um, I just pulled a couple of examples of ones that I see commonly here. There's a company here in the US called Let's Get Checked. Um, they offer a finger stick home text. Um, patients pay for this out of pocket. There is a follow-up consultation that can be done through telehealth with a nurse or a dietitian. And they have results that get reported to an app that lets patients track their results over time. So it's very um, simple. They're doing vitamin D, B12, vitamin E, copper, selenium, zinc, and magnesium. But obviously those are some flagship nutrients that we think about with bariatric surgery. Um, even though we're not seeing things like iron here, these could be considered tests that would be important for this population. Um, these are, you know, for the assays being performed, the same that you would be doing on whole blood. Um, and again, very simple for patients to do this in the privacy of their home and get rapid results. I find this one really interesting because this is actually an at-home test that gives on-the-spot results to patients through a urine test, similar to a urine pregnancy test. So basically, it's a card that they pee on, <laughs> and it gives an instantaneous result. Um, at this point, this company is testing for magnesium, vitamin C, calcium, sodium, uh, urinary pH, ke ketones, and I have actually seen from them some developmental data that they are working on a range of other micronutrients. If this kind of technology progresses, this actually gets me pretty excited because you could have patients keep a set of strips and, you know, test, you know, every three months, or if you're actually treating a deficiency, the, pot the potential to kind of monitor much more real time, um, the impact of treatment could be something that could be really valuable um, in patients. Um, this gets scanned directly to an app for patients and uh, the app itself for this company provides nutritional guidance and offers consultations with a health coach. But I think, you know, the real value here is in real time results. So other places we're seeing this show up, major labs are also jumping into the direct to consumer space. We've seen Quest and LabCorp here in the United States 
jumping in on this. They started with allowing patients to um, basically create their own lab requisitions and go to a laboratory and get tested, but they're moving to home testing. Uh, some of these tests have better validation than others. So if your patients are using home testing, it's good at least to have some understanding of how these compare to the tests that you would be running in your office. Some, but not all of these uh, systems are offering associated telehealth. So that's always important to keep in mind because those clinicians may or may not be familiar with bariatric surgery and this particular uh, intricacies of nutrition and bariatric surgery patients. And there is a range of other things moving into the home testing fear, sphere from um, uh, individual ability to order um, continuous glucose monitoring, um, microbiome testing, nutrigenomics. So this is a booming space um, that we're, I think, not going to see this go away. In fact, it's probably going to just get more specific um, since... I'm not involved in doing this. I think this is a real open opportunity for uh, an aspiring company or individual to go after working with one of these companies to make a bariatric specific offering. I think that could be, um, especially on the patient engagement side, very valuable. Okay, I'm going to switch over and talk a little bit about microbiome testing because I think that, you know, this is something that has been been talked about in the space of bariatrics as long as I've been around. Um, I remember reading a paper from uh, from John Morton's group um, when he was at Stanford a long time ago, where they were even just doing some very basic evaluation and finding some interesting things in terms of nutrient absorption. And we're seeing an increasing number of studies very specific to bariatric surgery and trying to understand not only the impact. Um, you know, on things like nutrition and weight loss, but just, you know, other health outcomes. And I think it's not entirely prime time yet, but it is certainly not going away. So I believe everyone in this group is probably familiar with the concept of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and I probably don't have to explain it to any of you. So I'm going to skip over that explanation. Um, this has been an early identified problem in bariatric surgery. And I think most people also know the history of SIBO and JIB. Um, while patients, you know, rarely experience um, deadly forms of SIBO anymore, which uh, thank goodness, the predicted uh, incidence with bariatric surgery overall is thought to be around 43% of patients postoperatively um, from combined surgeries with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And there is this little slight controversial idea, which I think is hanging out there that, um, you know, do we treat this or do we not treat this? Because potentially some degree of SIBO may be contributing to weight loss success. So I'll just leave that out there for the researchers to come back eventually with what the answer on that is. Um, what we do know in terms of nutrition is that uh, SIBO contributes both to nutrient deficiency and potentially to nutrient excess, and it is good to be aware of both of these things. So um, causes that could be, you know, related to surgery are not just, you know, the problem that was uh, there with a the blind loop in jib, but achlorhydria. So when we change the pH of the gut, we change the bacteria and uh, fungi that can live there. Pancreatic in insufficiency, which we you know think is present in maybe half of uh, distal bypass patients, um, is a contributor. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, has a very high incidence of SIBO, um, and there's probably some feedback there between the two, which I'm not going to go into today. Um, and then just, you know, direct uh, changes to the anatomy of the gut um, as a cause of SIBO. So what are we seeing here and what is research telling us about the microbiome and nutrient deficiency um, in terms of contribution to nutrition um, and deficiency? This list probably looks pretty familiar to most of you because these are a lot of the nutrient deficiencies that we talk about in bariatric surgery. Also macronutrient deficiency, remember the way that we diagnose SIBO, which is what I'm coming around to, is um, by giving a dose of a carbohydrate and literally, you know, looking at the changes in carbohydrate metabolism. So even a potential contribution here to the malabsorption of beneficial carbohydrates. And on the other side, nutrient excess, um, folate for sure, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and potentially some others. I'm always hesitant to list vitamin K as a nutrient excess just because we really don't have an upper limit um, of safety. 
So um, in terms of signs and symptoms, um, diarrhea, bloating, flatulence, and abdominal pain, but you may be seeing that in post-operative patients anyway for other reasons. Nutrient deficiencies that persist despite good compliance and despite um, you know, your interventions. So again, measuring compliance is always a little bit tricky. Um, it's not easy to do, but I think most people have a good internal sense if their patients are being honest about that. So go with that. Um, and, you know, things that we can see in labs, persistently elevated folate, um, particularly in the presence of other deficiencies like B12 or thiamine deficiency. So if you're seeing things that don't line up, B12 is high, uh, or B12 is very low and folate is very high. Folate is very high, thiamine is very low, and your patient is taking a B complex or a multivitamin with the range of those nutrients in it. So things that don't make sense, especially if one of those things is elevated folate. The testing here, um, there's a lot of reference still to bacterial culture of the small bowel. I don't in practice know anyone who is really doing that um, very often. Mostly this is hydrogen um, and methane breath testing. Um, again, this is another set of testings that at least here in the United States is coming into people's homes. Increasingly, this is being done as a home test kit with a, with a breath collection device that then gets sent into a lab. Um, it's certainly the easiest test. It may be needed to be modified after bariatric surgery, and there is some written literature about that, particularly because these beverages that are consumed um, may create some real challenges for patients um, with you know, a, an altered length of their bowel. And that does create some question of accuracy in patients who have intolerance to the, um, the beverage that is consumed uh, for this test. But despite that, um, we do, as I said, have a growing body of literature um, evaluating uh, SIBO in bariatric surgery patients using the conventional test methodologies. So um, usual treatment here is going to be antibiotics. Um, probiotics, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, I get asked about them a lot. I think as a treatment, I'm going to state that they're not ready for prime time yet. We definitely don't have enough data to recommend them over and above an antibiotic or, um, you know, something uh, on this list here uh, for treatment, but for pre prevention, maybe, maybe. I'm not totally ready to give that a hard yes yet, but um, I think there's some good arguments developing for, for probiotics and prevention. Okay. So to keep this short and sweet, uh, supplementation. <laughs> this next part that I'm going to talk about with pulsed iron dosing, I think is probably the most important thing I'm going to say in this whole lecture, because this is an, a concept for those of us who studied nutrition that was around a long time ago. Um, for, you know, we realized at some point, especially dosing people with chronic anemias, that um, there was sort of like a point where benefit of supplementing daily just leveled off and potentially even declined. And so even when I first studied nutrition, people were talking about this protocol of doing 21 days on and seven days off, kind of like a birth control pill, um, to allow um, the gut to basically refresh the, uh, the lining of the digestive system because ferritin will build up in enterocytes and really block your increased ability to absorb iron over time. And that was the thinking 25 years ago. And that was something I remember learning and thinking that's interesting. And then didn't really see anybody ever supplementing iron that way. And, you know, often, um, you know, just ignoring what we knew from that, but the newer research is really showing up on every other day dosing of iron. And that's something that I think I, I want to say this out loud for those of you researching, um, nutrition and bariatric surgery patients, I would love to see a bariatric specific study on this. Um, most of the data being collected right now is on uh, women with persistent iron deficiency anemia, but I think it's really valuable for this group to pay attention to just because a common deficiency, right? I mean, before and after surgery. So we see, you know, maybe 30% of patients preoperatively with iron deficiency, 40 to 60% uh, postoperatively with iron deficiency, and maybe 20% of patients who need intravenous iron at some point, potentially higher with some deficiencies than others. And tolerance of iron is always an issue. I mean, it causes digestive upset. It causes you know, constipation in some patients. It actually causes diarrhea. So we have a huge range of 
discomforts that lead patients to greater noncompliance. So why pulsed iron dosing? Um, the reason is because of hepcidin. Um, I actually have a great little visual on the next page, so I'm not going to linger on hepcidin too much here, but it is a peptide hormone that is our central regulatory hormone for the regulation of iron homeostasis. When we give oral iron supplements, hepcidin gets elevated. Okay, and that's really the big problem. And hepcidin is there in this, in this purpose to protect us from getting iron overload, right? So when hepcidin gets elevated, it tells the gut to stop absorbing iron. <laughs> that's a problem if you need people to have regularly elevated iron. And we've shown that this can happen on average at a dose of maybe 60 milligrams of elemental iron a day, more or less. We don't really know in bariatric surgery patients if that number is different. And this data is really limited to ferrous sulfate. So we don't know what this data looks like with other forms of iron. But what we do know is it'll stay elevated for 24 hours. Okay, which could, so brings us back to that every other day dosing schedule. When studies have been done in individuals taking doses of up to 200 milligrams of iron every other day versus every day, we see that hepcidin will then drop on that alternate day, allowing the body to get greatly increased absorption of iron on those um, on those other alternate days. So basically, you know, by letting people have an every other day break from their high dose iron supplementation, we are actually getting more iron into the body rather than less, okay? So even though the absolute amount of iron we're giving may be lower, the amount that the body is able to absorb because we are working with the signaling that's happening internally um, can be greatly increased. Okay, here's a nice little picture of what's happening here. When you have iron deficiency, hepcidin goes down and allows for more iron absorption from the gut or actually signals the gut to actually pull more iron in from food and supplements. However, when hepcidin is elevated, which we know happens in the presence of supplementation, it will actually block the absorption of iron from the gut. So we can work around that signaling by alternate day dosing. Okay. So moving from there just a little bit to probiotics, um, this is actually going to be the focus of my talk in September at the IBC Oxford meeting, so I'm not going to give away too much of that, but if you want to hear a full talk on this subject, come to Oxford and I'm going to be giving a big focus on what we know about the microbiome with bariatric surgery. Um, so uh, that's my plug for a fall. Come on out <laughs> and enjoy us. Um, well, some change huh? You're leaving us hanging. I am, but I'm going to say a little bit now. It's my teaser for September is right here. Um, while some changes in the microbiome um, may uh, impair uh, weight loss uh, and decrease GI quality of life and also impair nutrition. So, um, you know, this is really kind of something that I think gets lost sometimes when we talk about nutrition. We're talking a lot about, you know, compliance and, you know, what we're putting in and how we're putting it into the body and the form that we're putting it in, um, the length of the, you know, bowel and the length of the bypass. But we also have this other factor of these microorganisms that are playing a role in communicating with the body about nutritional needs, sometimes making their own nutrients. Um, and, you know, what, so what do we know? I mean, people often go straight to probiotics and say, well, we should just give probiotics as part of the regimen of what we're doing. Um, the truth is, you know, this is a real opportunity for research, but we do know a little bit. So um, I'll talk about a little bit about what we know and maybe some directions for future research um, to benefit bariatric surgery patients. So here's kind of what we know. Studies of probiotics uh, following bariatric surgery have primarily been shown to increase what we call GI quality of life. So those symptoms that are not like a full-blown, you know, infection or other something you can di diagnose, but where patients are just saying, I'm uncomfortable, I'm gassy, I'm bloated, my bowel movements aren't regular. Um, you know, they just don't feel good in their gut every single day. So species that we have uh, studied directly in bariatric surgery patients are primarily lactobacillus species, super readily available. I think globally these days, either um, supplemented into foods like yogurts, sometimes into beverages, um, or in capsules, tablets, chews. I mean, I think these are almost everywhere now. Um, this little organism, Clostridium uh, butericum, which is a um, 
a butyrate generating bacterium, not super readily available, but I think one to watch. And then also a very common bifidobacteria longum um, is another one that has been directly studied in bariatric surgery patients. Again, readily obtainable, inexpensive. Um, so particularly lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are very easy for people, I think, to obtain through food or supplements these days. We do have some data indicating that probiotic supplements may improve nutritional status, um, particularly improving B12 status. Um, that's the study I mentioned from Dr. Morton and the group at Stanford from back in 2009. Um, there was a study actually done in OAGB um, with a multi-strain formula showing improvement in vitamin D status, which I would love to see some follow-up data on that. It's very interesting. And um, I've given a link to the study there. If anyone wants to look up the formula, it was of, of like nine organisms. So I wasn't going to list them all here on this slide. Um, and then some in data that says that we may get some improvements in zinc and vitamin K and a handful of other nutrients based on what we know about some of these organisms' ability to actually um, increase nutrient production. So vitamin K is probably the best understood there. And then... Um, we do have data on probiotics in uh, reducing the incidence of uh, NAFLD, um, particularly before surgery, but a little bit of data after surgery as well. So I just liked this, this image because I grabbed it because I think, as I said today, you know, we focus a lot here on inadequate supplementation and diet and malabsorption. But what's happening in the microbiome, um, either with changes in the balance of bacteria, bacterial overgrowth, or otherwise, is really our fourth pillar of maintaining good nutritional health. And so I think, you know, again, for those of you who are conducting uh, research, I think this is an area that would be very rich for, um, you know, looking at how much this is really contributing to the nutritional health of uh, patients in the long term, as, as well as their quality of life. And with what we're learning about the microbiome, um, probably also to the, you know, contribution of development of other long term chronic diseases. Um, so we know that, you know, changes in the microbiome can have wide reaching effects on the immune system on, um, you know, on the brain and uh, mental functioning, um, uh, even, you know, distal areas like skin. So there's a lot of things that we really could be looking at to put uh, these pieces of the puzzles together and um, contributing to long-term health and quality of life in bariatric surgery patients. And with that, I will say thank you. I hope to see some of you in September um, and uh, really nice, again, great honor to be here. So thank you for the invitation to come speak today. Yep. Jacqueline, thank you for your excellent presentation. and. Looking for more for further information in Oxford next September. So um, the time is uh, quite finished. So let me to thank all the moderators, Hedo and um, Gaetano, all the speakers, and the organizer for inviting me to co-chair. It was really uh, an honor and a pleasure for me to co-chair this session, wonderful session with Professor Scott Shikora, who will give the final comments and remarks following this wonderful afternoon. Thank you. I want to thank all the speakers, moderators, the chairs, the audience, and also uh, the sponsors for this meeting, uh, Harris Kraja and Ariel Ortiz. This was an amazing webinar, one of the best that I've uh, been involved with for quite a while. The amount of material and the lessons learned were great. This should have been videotaped and given to everybody who's a member of the, uh, if so, or ASMBS. It was a true pleasure. We're looking at sort of the uh, dirty side of bariatric surgery when we normally look at the other side of all the great weight loss and how wonderful they feel and the diabetes going away and all that great stuff. Now we're seeing sort of the backside of it, which is the deficiencies and the problems with nutrition, which uh, obviously each of the members on this panel have an interest in, in improving. Uh, I want to just thank you all again and wish everybody a great couple of weeks and see you soon at ASMBS and if so. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery production. 
I want to thank our co-chairs, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. To view the complete Hot Topics and Surgery series, subscribe to our IABC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the fourth IBC Oxford University Congress is being held from September 18th through the 20th of 2023. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless. Ooh.